you know, there are messages that are harder to prepare than others because they tend to be more convicting. Even the last week's podcast, as John mentioned, it was on the subject of sports and how we as men engage with sports. And I was watching the Cowboys win on Monday Night Football last night, but they weren't winning early on in the game and it was not going well. And I found myself a little worked up about that. And my wife had listened to my podcast on how men should engage in a biblical and godly way with sports. And it was an opportunity for me to apply what, uh, what I had talked about in that podcast. But this message was one of those as well. The subject is not being a man of short temper, not being a man who is prone to anger, who has a a short fuse. Josh Hamilton recently found himself back in the news, and it's a, a tragic picture into a life that continues to spin further and further and further out of control. An article said this, according to an affidavit by the Keller Police Department, Detective Detective Hamilton's daughter told police about an incident on September 30th. She said she made a comment to Hamilton that upset him, so he threw a full bottle of water overhand at her, hitting her in the chest, then began cursing and shouting at her. He pulled away the chair on which she rested her feet and threw it, breaking the chair. It didn't hit her, but then he grabbed her by the shoulders and lifted her from the chair on which she sat, and she fell to the floor from which he lifted her, threw her over his shoulder, and carried her to her bedroom. The girl said at this point she was telling Hamilton, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Upon reaching her bedroom door, he tossed the teen onto her bed, pressed her face onto the mattress, and began hitting her legs with an open hand and a closed fist. She said that after he finished striking her, he told her, I hope you go in front of the judge and tell him what a terrible dad I am so I don't have to see you anymore and you don't have to come to my house again. You read that and and your heart breaks on so many different levels. You read that and you realize that in a single moment, Josh Hamilton's relationship with his daughter changed forever and not for the good. Because no matter what happens from here, his daughter is never going to be able to unhear the words that he spoke to her. His daughter is never going to be able to unthink uh, about it or, or remember the, the, the beating that she took from this man. The fact that he threw a, a water bottle directly at her and hit her. You see, men, anger can have absolutely devastating consequences in our lives. In a single moment of what the, the Bible describes over and over and over again as, as foolishness, we can make decisions, we can say things, we can act out in ways that destroy relationships, that ruin marriages, that leave our relationship with a family member who we love damaged forever because we've ingrained and burned in their memory words that we've spoken or things that we've done to them. It can destroy friendships and escalate conflict. And in God's economy, as he's looking for men who are going to be godly men, quality men of God, there's absolutely no room whatsoever for a man with a short temper. It's interesting, though, as we think about the Bible, if someone were to to ask you, who is the most angry person in the Bible, what would your response be? God. God is the most angry person in the Bible. Just a a sampling here, Isaiah 5.25. Therefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against his people, and he stretched out his hand against them and struck them, and the mountains quaked, and their corpses were as refuse in the midst of the streets. For all his anger has not turned away, and his hand is stretched out still. Or Isaiah chapter 10. Verse 5, woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, says the Lord. The staff in their hands is my fury. Isaiah 13, 9, behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and destroy its sinners from it. And maybe you're sitting there thinking, yes, but this is the Old Testament God. This is the God who's angry and who destroys the nations and other things like that. But let's go to Jesus. Mark chapter 3, verse 5. Mark chapter 3, verse 5. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at the hardness of their heart, and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and it was restored. So the most angry person in all of the pages of Scripture is God, and yet I'm here to tell us tonight that 
To be a man of God, a quality man of God, means that you are a man who is not an angry man. And so where's the disconnect? Well, the, the type of anger that God exercises is always the type of anger that classifies itself as righteous anger, as righteous indignation, which is the right response of a holy God against the flaunting of sin's injustice and unholiness. Righteous anger is the only right response to sin. And any time that we read that God is angry on the, in the pages of, of, of Scripture, it's this anger that is this righteous anger. As we think about our, ourselves, this is the only type of anger that is permitted in the pages of God's Word. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Man, this is a rare form of anger in our lives. I was looking at a, a, some news articles just today and I came across one that said 11,000 scientists have agreed that the population in the world is too high and we need to start exercising increased measures for population control, which means in scientific speak, we need to start killing babies. Man, when you read something like that, that can kindle something like righteous anger in us. It's anger over sin. It's anger over the offense against God. It's anger over seeing God's system turned upside down and the open and, and unabashed rebellion against God. But man, that's not really what we're here to address together tonight. What we're here to address together tonight is, is the anger that most of us are actually more prone towards. And that's an anger that's all about our, ourselves, our own agenda, our own ego, our own sense of justice in what's fair and what's not fair for us. This is what Paul was addressing in Titus chapter one. We've been looking at these qualities of, a, of an elder, qualities of a pastor, qualities of, of a godly man in general, right? And in Titus chapter one, verse seven, Paul says, for an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered. And so as God is laying out the blueprints for the, the man who he wants to lead his church, as God is laying out the blueprints for a godly man, one of those attributes that we find is that he must not be a man who is quick-tempered. If this attribute was to appear in a, a positive sense, we would say that the man of God must be a patient man, a man of long-suffering, a man able to endure and it's this man that God wants to lead, and it's this man that God desires you and I to be, because really at the root of it, when it, we boil down anger, yes, it comes from our pride and our self-centeredness, but really what's underneath it all is a lack of trust in God. It's us saying to God, I know better than you, God. I know what's right for me, and what's happening to me right now is not right for me, and so I'm angry about it, and this is not fair. God wants us to be dependent upon him. He wants us to trust him, no matter the circumstances. You may think to yourself, you know what, well, I'm, I'm not a man like Josh Hamilton, prone to anger like that. And I would say, praise God, but that doesn't mean that this message is not for you. Because there are other forms of anger. It's the anger out, angry outburst, the, angry, the, the, the violence of Hamilton. And there may be some men in the room tonight who are, are prone to that. That's the way that you express your anger, is through aggression, through physicality. Another way that we often express our anger is through our, our words. We use our words as weapons. We say the things that we know are going to cut deep. As the writer of Proverbs, as Solomon says, our words become sword thrusts. Another form of anger that we as men can often employ is passive aggressiveness. And this takes place a lot within the marriage. You become angry and so you shut down, you get silent, you pull back, you reserve, you change plans, you do the thing that is passive, but you know that it's going to be something that's gonna wound and hurt your wife. We can also use anger in the forms of manipulation to get our way. When we become angry, we begin to uh, manipulate. We begin to, 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 to pull at the heartstrings. We begin to, to set things up to try to get our way when our way has been foiled. Anger can also manifest itself in just shortness. You, you're curt, you're short, you're abrupt with your family members, with your wife, with your friends. And then, men, another way that sinful anger can manifest itself is through just simply stuffing it down. 
So when we talk about not being quick-tempered, that doesn't mean that you deal with anger by just simply stuffing it down and forgetting about it. That's another way that, that we can be sinful in the way that we deal with our response to adverse circumstances. Well, we're going to be in Proverbs 14, 29. Proverbs 14, 29, there's so many different way, places that we could have landed, different Proverbs that deal with this subject of anger, but this one I think is, is very straightforward, very clear to us, and it's helpful for us to understand. It says this, whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. I want to look at that, that last part first. The one who has a hasty temper exalts folly. The word exalt there means to, to lift it high, to bring it to its fullest measure, to call attention to it. So in other words, what, the, what Solomon is saying here is he's saying, look, you who are prone to a short temper, you are raising your foolishness up the flagpole and waving it for everyone to see. You're leaving no doubt in anyone's mind what kind of man you are. And Solomon would say, you're a, a fool. He exalts. He broadcasts his foolishness for everyone to know. This is the type of anger, obviously, that's, that's not righteous anger. That's not anger over sin because of its rebellion against God. It's, it's anger that's fueled by self-interest and self-righteousness. And it's an anger that we need to avoid at all costs because of its outcome. And that is this foolishness. Point number one for you tonight is this. Recognize the folly of a short fuse. Recognize the folly of a short fuse. Edward James is the name of a, a chair umpire from Wimbledon in 1981. And he was serving during a match between Patrick McEnroe and a guy whose last name starts with T that I can't remember. And nobody else does, right? And in this match, McEnroe, and I watched the video this afternoon in pre preparing for this message, and it's clear as day, McEnroe's serve was in. You see the chalk kick up off the, the serve line. It was a good serve, and the judge called it out. Well, the rest is history, right? Because a, a young McEnroe goes over to the line judge, or to the chair umpire, and he looks up at him, and what does he say? You can't be serious! And he goes off on one of his tirades. That, and, until that point, nobody really knew. He wasn't as well known. But you think of McEnroe, and more often than not, now some of you diehard tennis fans out there could tell me every single match that he won, right? But the majority of people know McEnroe as a, a hothead, don't they? They know him for that line. You can't be serious! Because he went on to, to, to say it numerous times after that in his career. I mean, you think of, of athletes that are known for their, their temper. You think of John Daly on the golf course, right? That guy was a hothead known for his temper. Tiger Woods in his, his younger years. Still, even now, you, you, the, if you're not careful and the, they don't cut off the mics fast enough with Tiger Woods, you'll hear something that you don't want to hear when he's out on the, the golf course. The, the temper that, that they lash out and you, you watch it and you go, you guys are just foolish, right? This is ridiculous. It's interesting, in, in Exodus 34, Moses asks God to see his glory. And you remember the scene. God takes Moses and he puts him in the cleft of a, a, of a rock to protect him from the full display of his glory because he would have died had he seen that. And that the way that the, the Bible describes it is that Moses sees the backside of God's glory. He sees it in a, in a dimin diminished sense, a sense that he could see it and yet still live, and yet it was still... Uh, an amazing and overwhelming sight for Moses. But as, as God passes before Moses, with Moses in the rock, with his hand over Moses, he declares something to Moses. And what he declares is he declares his character to Moses. But the way he does so is worth note. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, this is Exodus 34, 6, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. That's amazing. That's amazing. Because Moses didn't say, God, show me the, the gentle side of you. He didn't say, God, reveal to me the things that make me comfortable about who you are. And so God could have passed before Moses and declared his holiness and his righteousness and his justice and his wrath and his power. And his omniscience, 
In his omnipresence, he could have declared all of those things before Moses and been right in doing so. And yet the way that God chose to identify himself before Moses is the Lord, the Lord of God, merciful and gracious and slow to anger. In fact, nine times in the Old Testament alone, God reveals himself and attributes himself and, and declares that he is a God slow to anger. Men, one of the reasons why we want to be men who are slow to anger is because we want to be like God. And God is self-proclaimed to be a God who is slow to anger. To be quick-tempered is to be a fool. How do you know if this is you? Let me ask a few questions of you. Number one, does your family feel that they have to walk on eggshells around you? Is there a certain time when you get home from work or after you've had a, a, a bad day, whatever it may be, do you create an environment with your temper, with your anger, where your family feels like they're afraid of you? Two, do you become violent or physical when you become angry? And I'm not talking about necessarily that you become physically abusive to a person, but do you abuse other things? Do you have holes in your wall at home that you look at and you go, that, that was me when I was angry? Do you have broken golf clubs in the garage? Do you have dents in your dashboard? Whatever it may be, are, are you prone to violence and physicality when you get angry? Three, are you quick to raise your voice when you become angry? Are you quick to raise your voice when you become angry? Four, do you become passive aggressive with your anger? Shutting down, retreating. Fifth, do you express your anger with hurtful words? Are there situations in green, not only in the mind of those that you've hurt, but in your mind where you say, man, I, I remember when I said this to this person and I wish I hadn't said that. Seven, six, sorry. When you get angry, does it spill over into other relationships and environments? If something happens at work that makes you mad, do you bring that home with you? Does that invade your relationship with your wife, with your kids? Does a conflict with your wife spill over into your anger towards your children, your impatience with your children? He who has a hasty temper exalts folly. We run it up the flagpole and let everybody know that we are a fool. Proverbs 29, 22 says this, 29, 22. A man of wrath stirs up strife and one given to anger causes much transgression. This anger, this foolish anger, it's, it's anger that's impulsive. It's anger that's self-centered. It's anger that is arrogant. Again, that says, I know what's right, I know what's good, I know what should happen, and when it doesn't happen, I'm gonna get angry over that. It's anger that is, is lazy. Man, it is, it is lazy to be an angry man. It is far more difficult to deal with your, your emotions and what's going on with your thought process in a biblical and godly way. It's far harder to do that than to just lash out at someone. That is laziness. It's anger that is short-sighted. You don't think about the consequences when you lash out. You're bent on immediate gratification and satisfaction of your thirst for revenge. And it's anger, finally, that's anti-gospel. It's anti-grace. It's anti-mercy. And it's anti-forgiveness. It's anger that sets aside how much God has forgiven you, how patient God has been with you, how kind God has been with you, how gracious God has been with you, how merciful God has been with you. It sets all of that aside and you say, in essence, in effect, you say to God, yes, but this person's offense against me is greater than my offense against you. And so yes, God, you were patient with me, but don't ask me to be patient with this person. 
Ecclesiastes 7, 9, be not quick, be not quick in your spirit to become angry, for angry, anger lodges in the heart of fools. God doesn't want a man who's prone to anger, who's quick temper. Instead, he says, whoever is slow to anger has great understanding. He's contrasting the wise and the fool in, in Proverbs 14, 29. And we just saw the fool, but now the, the, the key to wisdom, and the key to wisdom here is patience, being slow to anger. One commentator translated this verse this way, patience is the evidence of understanding. Patience is the evidence of understanding. When the word there, whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, it's a word that was interchangeable with wisdom in the book of Proverbs. In Proverbs 3.13, we read, blessed is the one who finds wisdom, and then the parallel, and the one who gets understanding. There we see wisdom and understanding put in parallel with one another. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 19. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. Again, their wisdom and understanding are put in parallel with one another. And so what Solomon is saying here in Proverbs 14, 29, is he's saying, you want to be known as a man of, of patience? You want to be known as a man of, of understanding? It's going to make itself known by how you react to adverse situations in your life. Think about the men in your life that you turn to for advice and for counsel, for guidance, for wisdom, for understanding, for help making decisions. How many of those men are men who are given to anger, who are prone to anger? My guess is not very many. I guess is the majority of the men that we look to and that we trust and we seek advice from are men who are patient, who are level-headed, who have the ability not to lose their temper at the drop of a hat, but have the ability to, to think through things and remain calm in the face of adversity. In fact, the writer of Proverbs, Solomon, says the same thing in Proverbs 10, 13. Proverbs 10, 13. On the lips of him who has understanding, wisdom is found but a rod is for the back of him who lacks sense. On the lips of him who has understanding, wisdom is found. How do I have understanding and wisdom? Part of it is, I'm not a quick-tempered man. I'm slow to anger. I hope this is something that all of us desire. It's certainly something that God desires. And if you desire to be a man of wisdom, then patience and being slow to anger has to be a key part of that pursuit. It's our second point tonight is this. Let your patience reveal your wisdom. Let your patience reveal your wisdom. When I was a younger man in seminary, I was attending a church and I was a pastoral intern and I got the privilege to be brought in on elder meetings. And I remember sitting in these elder meetings and our elders had a principle of unanimity. In other words, a decision wouldn't be made unless everybody was on board and everybody was in agreement, which made for some very, 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 very long meetings. And sometimes, two, three hours, no lie, two, three hours into these conversations and discussions, the tensions would get on edge. People would get a little emotional about things. But there was one man on that elder board whose name was Randy. And it, it seemed like Randy was quiet the whole time. And then at the very end, he would speak up and he would say something. And all of us would look at him and go, why didn't you say that three hours ago? That's what we've been driving at. That's what the answer is. Where have you been on this? But the thing is, is he was wisely laying back, being patient, taking everything in, not getting his emotions involved in it, and he was able to make a, a wise assessment of things. And so we came to value that. I think there's a contrast. If any of you saw the, the post-game interview with Garrett Cole, which I watched because I was rejoicing in the loss of the Houston Astros. It was a great day when the Astros lost that game. I don't even like the Nationals. I just don't like the, the Astros that much. Anyways, they were interviewing Garrett Cole, and I, it was brilliant, because what was Garrett Cole wearing, for those of you that saw the interview? Was he wearing an Astros hat? No. He was wearing the hat of his agent, Scott Boris. And in fact, he was asked a question, and he said, well, I can't answer that question as an employee of the Astros, because I'm no longer an employee of this organization. This is minutes after the World Series Game 7 is over. Like, he's still under contract with them, I think, at that point. And he says that, well, I, I, they don't employ me any longer. He goes, so I'll, I'll answer those questions as a representative of myself. Do you see how rash that is and impetuous that was? And you know what drove that? Anger. He was angry. He was angry over losing. He was angry over not being used when he should have been used. 
He was angry over not being in the spotlight. He was angry over losing out on the endorsement deals that being a World Series winning pitcher would have brought him. He was angry. And he, rather than being a man of patience and restraint and acting wisely and showing his understanding, what did he do? He took his foolishness and rang it up, ran it up the flagpole for everybody to see, didn't he? See, more often than not, men, it'll be our words that betray an angry and impatient spirit. And it'll be our words that betray an understanding and wise spirit. Solomon, Proverbs 18. If you want to improve your speech and your communication, live in Proverbs 18. Proverbs 18, 6. I love this verse. Go to it in counseling a lot. Proverbs 18, 6. A fool's lips walk into a fight and his mouth invites a beating. <laughs> we laugh, but it's uncomfortable that we laugh, right? Because we've been there, haven't we? Proverbs 18, 13. If one gives an answer before he hears, it's to his folly and shame. How many times are we in an argument, a debate, a, 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 a contesting an issue with somebody and we're not even listening to what they're saying to us. What we're doing is we're forming our answer before we've even heard what their response is gonna be. Proverbs 18, 17. The one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. Again, that humility. Man, we mean, need to be men of, of, of patience, men of restraint. I think our president has done many great things, but opening a Twitter account was not one of them. <laughs> if you follow President Trump on Twitter, you don't do as he does. It's an example of unrestrained anger that just turns into verbal vomit in 280 characters. Impulsive and rash anger is the enemy of wisdom. So how can we be wise? How can we battle against that? How can we be men of patience and reveal understanding? Number one, know what your triggers are and avoid those topics at all costs. Right? I, I know that if the Cowboys lose, there are certain people I'm just not going to engage with <laughs> because they're going to rub it in my face. Right? And so I don't talk to Pastor Pete for the rest of that. No, I'm just kidding. He's great on that. But there's, there's things that, that can be our triggers, right? That can light us up. And you know what those are. Steer away from those topics of conversation because if you don't, you are a fool who's walking into the fight and inviting a beating with your mouth. Second, if you want to be a man of patience, walk by the Spirit. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and what's the next one? Patience. Patience. Be a man of the word. Be a man of prayer. Being a man, being a man who is, is cultivating a, a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Give attention to your personal walk with Christ. If you want to increase in your patience, it's going to be an overflow of your connection and your intimacy with God. Walk by the Spirit. Third, practice thanksgiving. Practice thanksgiving. It's difficult for us to be anger, angry when we're thankful. Fourth, Cultivate a robust trust in the Lord. Isaiah 26.3, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. It's the idea of, of being trusting of the Lord. Fifth, focus on the things that cannot fail. The Apostle Paul in Romans 8.25 Hope for what you cannot see. Trust in those things. Look to those things. Anchor your hope there. Finally, six, follow the example of Christ. Think of how patient he was with the disciples. In fact, he even brings it up, John 14, 19. I, have I been with you this long and still you guys don't get it? But yet he was patient with them. 
Or you think of, of Jesus' example at the crucifixion, right? He's being mocked by those that he had a hand in creating. He's being mocked. Physician, physician, save yourself. Heal yourself. You saved others, save yourself. Get down from the cross. Call down the legions of angels. And men, when, when we're mocked, how quick are we to get self-righteous and indignant and, and angry in response? And yet the model of our Savior, what does Isaiah say? He opened not his mouth like a sheep who was silent before its shearers. When you follow the example of Christ in that, this type of patience, it, it demands, it requires humility. Humility to trust the Lord. Humility to, to understand that we are here to serve rather than being served. Humility to see those times of, of annoyance with others as a glimpse into ourselves at times in the eyes of God and to say, how patient is God with me? I need to be patient with others as well. If y'all were with us during the summer, one of the books that we covered was the book of what? Jonah, right? And at the end of the book of Jonah, Jonah is a case study in a quick-tempered man in a lot of ways. Because at the end of the book of Jonah, after he's been in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, you think, okay, well, that, that should have been a, a sufficient wake-up call for Jonah. And it looks so promising when the, the fish throws him up on the, the, the beach and he gets up and he's thinking to himself, all right, God, I'm ready to go. If you did all of that and you saved me from certain death in the, the depths of the sea by appointing this fish, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to follow you. I will go to Nineveh. And we think, finally, Jonah, you get it, right? But Jonah goes to Nineveh and he begins to proclaim this message of repentance. And much to the dismay of Jonah, the Ninevites respond. They repent. And they, they, they exercise faith in the Lord on a massive scale such that even the king gets down from his throne and puts on sackcloth and sits on the, the heap of ashes. And we expect the response to be what, what any of us would think if we saw a, a, a godless nation repent as believers. Hopefully we would rejoice in that. But we see Zo Jonah and it's zoomed in on Jonah. And what does Jonah do? He gets angry. In fact, not just angry, he throws a fit, a petulant toddler style fit. And he goes out outside the city and he sits down outside the city and he says, God, kill me. And God, to teach an object lesson to Jonah, appoints a, a plant because it's hot out. And the plant grows up and it, it, it's a big plant. And people want to say, what kind of plant it was? Who cares? It's a God plant. <laughs> and it shades Jonah. And Jonah sits in the cool of the, the, the plant and he sits there and he thinks to himself, this is not fair. And he's stewing in his anger, right? But he's thankful for the, the plant. Well, then the next day, a worm from God shows up. What kind of worm? I don't know, a God worm. And it eats the plant. And the plant dies. And Jonah gets angry over the plant dying. And God calls him out, doesn't he? He says, do you do well to be angry? Man, that's a question we all need to ask ourselves. Anytime we find ourselves angry, we need to hear the Lord asking us, do you do well to be angry? And what God proceeds to do then is to show Jonah the irrationality of his anger. He says, Jonah, you're angry over this plant. You didn't work for the plant. You didn't water the ground. You didn't dig it out. You didn't plant it. You didn't care for this plant. You did, you did nothing for this plant. Oh, and by the way, it's, it's a plant, Jonah, and you're angry over the plant in the destruction of the plant but you care nothing for the souls in the city of Nineveh. And so he's showing Jonah the self-centeredness of his anger, just like our anger is so often anchored to our self-centeredness. Man, it seems the one who is slow to anger, the one who's mastery over this area of his life is one who understands how little he really knows about the big picture to begin with. Man, if we will confess that, that our understanding of God's plan in our lives is, is pretty minuscule, and if we will acknowledge that God knows what he is doing, that God is in perfect control of all things, that God is sovereign, that God is working all things together for our good, if we will keep that at the forefront of our mind, it will go a long way in our battle with anger. 
Again, patience in the face of adversity requires this kind of humility to continue in steadfast confidence that the Lord is working out his will and his plan to perfection. Our final point tonight is this. Remember who rules your life. As you're battling to be a man who's slow to anger and not quick-tempered, remember who rules your life. In Romans chapter 9, the Apostle Paul gives us a great illustration on this front. He talks about the clay and the potter. And he says, what right has the clay to say to the potter, how dare you make me for this end, for these means? What right has the clay to do that to the creator? And obviously the answer is what? None. The clay has no right to question the potter. But men, when we are men who are quick-tempered, it's exactly what we're doing. When we lash out in anger, that is precisely what we are doing. We are throwing a fist in the face of God and questioning what he's doing. And declaring, I know better than you. My timing is better than yours. My sense of justice is greater than your sense of justice. What's owed me as a result of a sin against me, God, is greater than what's owed you as a result of a sin against you. Romans 12, 19. Romans 12, 19. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. See, man, impulsive, rash anger robs God of his right to avenge and makes the offense about us more than about God. Psalm 51.4, remember that, David? What does David say there? He says, against what? Against you, God, and you only have I sinned, okay? Now, we oftentimes put ourselves in the point of, of David there and say, we need to understand that our sin is first and foremost a sin against God. But I want you to put yourself in the shoes of Uriah, and you say, well, Uriah was dead. Okay, just bear with me for a minute. Think of... Uriah overhearing that. What do you think Uriah's response would have been? Excuse me? What? Are you kidding me? You can't be serious. Right? He would have been John McEnroe before McEnroe. But guys, that's, that's reality. And so when we are sinned against, we need to remember Psalm 51.4, that the person who has sinned against us has sinned first and foremost before the offense is against us. It's against God. And God has first rights to revenge. Exclusive rights to revenge. Because here's the reality. If God chooses to exact revenge and vengeance, there's going to be nothing left for you to avenge. So you can trust him in that. But guys, we need to remember that, that sin against us is, is far greater a sin against God than it is sin against us. And if we can keep that in mind, it's going to keep us patient in the face of adversity. Too often our anger is anger on behalf of, of ourselves, over our sense of what's right and what's wrong, over our sense of justice, over our desire for vengeance. And this is why Solomon, and then later James says, be slow to anger. If you're out driving out and about on, on New Year's Eve, there's oftentimes police that are stationed all around the city, right? And what are they stationed for? Those are called what kind of checkpoints? Sobriety checkpoints, right? Sobriety checkpoints. And they're there to make sure that the cars, even if you're not driving erratically, they're going to stop you at the checkpoint and they're going to at least have a conversation with you just to make sure that you're not intoxicated. Well, man, in your path to anger, you need to make sure there are plenty of sobriety checkpoints along the way. Plenty of things in place to make sure that you don't get to that place of ungodly and irrational anger. That you can stop and that you can confess and that you can repent before you get too far down the road. What do those sobriety checkpoints look like for us when it comes to anger? Number one, bring another brother into the situation. If you are fuming, if you are seething, and you feel like, man, this feels like this is righteous anger here. Let me encourage you to bring another brother into that situation. Call a brother up on the phone and say, hey, 
can I share with you what's happened to me? I'm, I'm really angry right now and I need you to help me work through this. Get their perspective. Somebody who's not involved in the situation and, and it may be that, that they need to talk you down and if nothing else, they need to help you deal with what might be righteous anger in a godly way. So when you feel anger, don't isolate yourself. It's the worst thing to do. Second, men who are married, listen to your wife. This can be hard when you're angry. And she asks you, hey, aren't you preaching on that this week? Nope. Nope, we're not having that conversation right now. No, listen to your wife, right? God has put her there for a reason. And then next, following from that and, and not unconnected to that, be quick to repent and ask for forgiveness. If you're confronted on your anger, be quick to repent and ask for forgiveness. And again, man, that is hard to do. Why? Because anger is fueled by self-centered pride and, and confession and repentance kills self-centered pride. Fourth, think of what you're modeling for your children if you've got kids at home. Think of what they are seeing in you when they see you angry. Fifth, think of how much you have wronged the Lord. We've hinted at this already in this message, but think about how much you've been forgiven, how patient God has been with you, how slow to anger God has been with you. And remember that so that you might be able to push back from the table and say, okay, so who am I then not to exercise mercy and forgiveness and grace and slowness to anger with someone else? Finally, ask yourself what your anger is producing. What is your anger producing? More often than not, it's going to be more sinful attitudes and sinful behaviors. Again, why is this so important to God? Well, yes, because it's, it's fueled by that pride. It's fueled by that, that selfishness, that arrogance. But again, the, the biggest reason why this is such an important attribute and quality in the man of God is because it, to, to be a man who is angry is to be a man who doesn't trust God. It's to be a man who doubts him, who doesn't believe that what he's doing is what's good. Who says, I know better. Who says, I need my wrongs to be righted according to my agenda, my time frame, my schedule. And what God wants from us men is humble trust in him, confidence in him, and trusting ourselves to him. Again, a man given to anger just like Hamilton can do irreparable damage to his life in a minute. Man, you are one angry outburst away from a destroyed testimony. From broken relationships with your children. And from possible irreparable damage to your marriage. One outburst away. This is serious. Anger is a, a deadly sin. And one that for too long, I feel like maybe we as a church of Church Big C have swept under the carpet as, as one of our respectable sins. And I think we need as, as men to bring it out into the light, to deal with it, to mortify it and to live as faithful men of God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your patience with us. God, I thank you so much that you are a God who is slow to anger. Gracious, merciful, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. God, thank you. Thank you that you have not exacted impetuous rage upon us because none of us in this room would be sitting here. Thank you that you were long-suffering with us that you overlooked offenses against you in order to bring us to the point of confession, repentance, and, and faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. 
God, ingrain that in our minds and allow that to transform the way that we live our lives, increase our faith and our trust in you such that no matter what comes into our lives, God, we can remain calm, we can remain patient, and we can remain long-suffering and know that you are working all things according to the good for those who love you. Father, make us men who lead well in this way at home, at work, and in the church. We pray in Christ's name, amen.